Okay, so that's a couple of minutes past, so we'll kick off with today's session. So welcome to the last in this series of three webinars from cybersecurity company Cytel. In the first webinar, we covered what fuzz testing actually is, uh, which we will briefly recap at the start of this session. And in the second webinar, we discussed how to select the right fuzzing tool for smart meters. If you would like more details on either of these topics, our first and second webinars are available on demand via the CITAL YouTube page, but we will also share the links after today's session. So I'm Rebecca and I am your host again today. So firstly, I need to let you know that this session is being recorded and will be shared with attendees for on-demand viewing. In today's session, we'll learn how to integrate fuzz testing into your software development lifecycle. The CITAL team will talk through the benefits of embedding a fuzzing capability into your existing processes and why it should be considered a valuable tool in your cybersecurity toolbox. There will be time at the end of the session for any questions, so please do send them through using the Q&A button on your screen. Joining us today from CITAL, we have Tony, Matt and Chris, who have decades of experience in cybersecurity and are all contributors to CITAL's unique fuzz testing tool, Protocrawler. So that's it from me. I'll now hand over to Tony to kick off the session and tell us what fuzz testing actually is. Thank you very much, Becky. And uh, I'm just going to do a brief recap here, really. Uh, there's more detail of this in our first webinar that you can find uh, on the YouTube channel if, if you're interested. But fundamentally, fuzzing is where we have a, a tool, in our case, Protocrawler, on the left, and it generates automatically uh, huge volumes of deliberately and carefully malformed and out of specification messages that we then send to the target on the right and we observe the behavior through the tool. We observe what happens. We gather evidence of what happens when those malformed messages are processed. We collect it all and then automatically analyze it, looking for unexpected or suspicious behavior from the target. In terms of uh, protocol, we use this model for looking at fuzzing. Uh, it breaks the fuzzing process down into four stages. And the point about each of these stages is that they separate out different places where we can make a specification of what we want to achieve. Uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can measure what we're achieving and we can therefore customize the particular targets if we need to at each of these stages. So the first of these is generation, where, as you'd expect, we automatically generate the large numbers of messages and have them ready. In the execution stage, we send all of those messages to particular targets and we collect the evidence uh, of the behavior while they're running. Then we get to analysis, where we ask particular questions about the complete set of results and other evidence and we generate prioritized lists, therefore, in our terms, scored lists of the uh, issues that we've found. And we, in that process, we use, again, the understanding of the protocol model that we had to generate the original messages. The final stage we get to is reporting. And this is about making those uh, results, the demonstration of, of resilience available uh, either internally to other parties that don't have protocol or even externally to third party stakeholders who may need to uh, make judgments about the uh, resilience and the assurance in the tool. Finally, in our second webinar that you can also find on the YouTube channel, uh, we talked about the different types of fuzzing. And so to very quickly summarize that here, the first two points you can see here are, are about our, our choice, which is basically to use black box fuzzing for smart metering in particular, because it directly represents the, the real world operating environment of, of uh, the product. And similarly, it directly represents the sorts of attacks that you can expect to be carried out by a conventional attacker 
who is who is not privileged in the sense that they don't have access to uh, the internals of the device or uh, the internals of the of the firmware. The last two points here are contrasting that with uh, what we would be doing otherwise. Um, so the, one of the points here is we're trying to test the real system behavior, the real deployed system behavior, rather than something that happens uh, on, on an emulated platform or another platform. And we're avoiding uh, the need to do code instrumentation, uh, which again, takes us further away from the real final system behavior. So that's the summary of uh, those events, uh, of those um, previous webinars. I'm now going to hand you over to Matt, who's going to talk about embedding fuzzing into an LD SDLC. Over to you, Matt. OK, perfect. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and welcome to the webinar, everyone. And thanks for joining. Um, yes, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the SDLC. Um, I'm going to start by looking at a typical project lifecycle for a smart meter development. Um, you'll quickly see that this is quite a generic diagram. So uh, we're talking about smart metering today, but actually it applies to, to many different types of, of products. Um, and you might think, well, why are we showing you this diagram when, when the webinar is about fuzzing? Uh, and I will get to that. Uh, so if we look at the, the first uh, three stages of this diagram, actually cybersecurity from a product sense starts uh, from the, pro the project initiation step. So uh, what do we mean there? So um, when, when we talk about cybersecurity, the first thing we need to do is understand the, the threat. So what product are we actually talking about? Where's it going to go? Who's going to be using it? What sort of processes does it have? What sort of interfaces does it have? Um, where, where does it fit into the, into the supply chain? Um, and therefore, what are the risks? What are the attack vectors? What are the different possible ways that uh, this device could be, could be compromised? Um, from there, we start to establish a set of security assurance principles and, and some plans for how we uh, mitigate those threats and, and what types of things we can do in the design process uh, to build in security by design and also start to think about ways of testing whether we've done what we should have done from a security perspective. So, so this is fundamentally important, not just for smart metering, but indeed for, for any product development process. In, in the smart metering industry, we obviously have a whole bunch of industry working groups that work together to, to pull together this information, not just to, to get things kicked off, but to keep it up to date with, with, with emerging uh, threats and, and, and industry standards and so on and so forth. Um, now, when we get into the design and into the implementation phase, uh, what we see is developers are starting to put in place uh, the development infrastructure, the, 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 the test tools to allow them to uh, build confidence, grow confidence in, in their products as the development progresses. And a lot of the activity is around scripting positive test cases, basically just checking whether the device is doing what, what you feel it should be doing, either based on your own requirements or some uh, external specification that that, that is industry driven. Um, but what's often what we often find is that people rarely uh, look at the problem from the other way around. So so it, have have we fully understand what the device shouldn't be doing? Yeah, have we done enough, enough negative testing? And at what point do we start doing some of this negative testing? Now, in the case of smart metering, uh, in the UK, certainly we have a commercial product assurance scheme uh, where we have a uh, cybersecurity certification and within there we have some fuzzing requirements and therefore vendors are essentially mandated to, to do fuzzing. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily uh, point to when you should start that 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 fuzzing activity. And what we've seen historically is a lot of vendors uh, tend to start that fuzzing process um, somewhere between the implementation and the pre-production phase. Uh, in other words, they're testing when the product is already reasonably mature. Uh, and of course, the advantage of doing that is you have the potential to iron out anything that you've missed with other testing. The disadvantage being that if you find anything significant, you may have significant things that you need to go away and, and figure out and rework, et cetera. And obviously, the later you find those problems, the more it's going to cost you to fix them. So th this is the reason why, why we bring this slide up. Um, 
I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit more about the, the life cycle, and I'm going to focus uh, on um, the design and the de development phase, more specifically, uh, the, the pre-production phase uh, and the maintenance lifetime. Um, we're talking pretty high level here. There are all sorts of different software development life cycles in place these days, uh, lots of different variants, but they all have some aspect of design development, pre-production and maintenance. So, so hopefully that's uh, that's clear to everyone. Uh, so let's look at uh, fuzz testing during the, the early development process. So, so this is, uh, as a cybersecurity business that, that uh, does a lot of fuzz testing, we're obviously uh, saying that this is something that is very good to be doing. Uh, fuzzing can actually start when the product development has reached uh, minimal and viable maturity. And by that, we mean we've got a minimum level of building blocks in the product that you can actually call it a product and you've actually got something uh, meaningful to, to test. So that's the earliest stage that really you, you would want to, to start fuzzing and um, putting in place um, a, a process where you can automate uh, and progressively build up a set of um, fuzz tests will help you to spot implementation bugs early on in, in the product's development. Um, and as I've already mentioned, the earlier you spot these things, uh, the cheaper it is to fix them. Um, and, and that's kind of uh, an obvious point, but it's, obvious, uh, it, it's, it's quite often missed, we find. Um, the automated fuzz testing process, um, it's not designed to replace other testing methods. It's complementary. It augments other testing activities that you might have going on. Uh, and we often find that it will pick up on things that other testing just hasn't. And that's kind of one of the benefits of it, really. Um, so the earlier you do it, uh, the, the better you will um, uh, reap the benefits. And the benefits do actually compound. So we've worked with lots and lots of companies throughout their product lifecycle. And we've seen that firsthand, how the longer you have been doing fuzzing, uh, the more benefits you get over time. Um, we've also seen situations where fuzzing has been adopted quite late uh, and uh, we've had some fairly bumpy rides where we've had some uh, unnecessary inter iterations, uh, you know, project delays, things like this. And, and this isn't good for anyone. It's frustrating for developers. It's frustrating for test labs as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be done to, to avoid that type of thing. Uh, so if I move on to pre-production now, um, irrespective of whether you've done any fuzz testing in, in the early stages of development, uh, it's normally a very good idea to do some uh, prior to putting the device out into the field, because uh, fuzzing gives you the opportunity to pick up on potential gotchas be before it's too late. You do not want uh, end customers or indeed uh, attackers finding problems in the field that you should have picked up uh, during your, your development process. Um, now, fuzzing as a requirement, as mentioned on, on previous webinars, is increasingly required by a whole range of standards. Uh, standards aren't just written for the sake of it. They're generally based on best practice and, and lessons learned from, from the past. Um, so you'll see, I think, more standards uh, for all sorts of different products referencing fuzzing as, as we move forward. And whether something is mandated or not doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Uh, so if you're going to release a product to market and you're going to sell, be selling these things in the millions um, and they're going to be deployed in, in sort of publicly open areas and things like that, it's sensible to do some fuzzing. Uh, it's gather, it helps you gather useful evidence of, of resilience uh, of the product, uh, which might be relevant for third party review. So if you're having to uh, show this evidence to a test lab or a certification body, for example, um, then obviously it's useful for that. And sometimes, and, and increasingly, we see written into procurement requirements these days that uh, certain cybersecurity standards have to be met. And this is a way of evidencing that they have been met. So gathering um, information for um, both uh, internal uh, confidence that a product has been put through its paces, but also meets the requirements of some of those procurement uh, thresholds is important as well. And, and once again, fuzzing is not uh, intended to attend uh, to uh, replace something like penetration testing, um, but it does complement it. Uh, so yeah, moving on to to the maintenance life sense. I, I think it's fair to say that product deployments these days are no longer install and forget. So uh, meters, for example, tend to have a fifteen year lifespan. Um, a lot can happen in that time in terms of 
the system, potential attack vectors, changes in standards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you've got lots of working groups, things on things do tend to, to move forward, specifications tend to change, um, and vendors do need to try and keep up with that stuff. So expect to uh, issue new releases of product. Um, and when you're doing that, expect there the, to be a risk of introducing things that you didn't intend to um, in those new features. It might be in, 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 entirely in your control, uh, i.e. the product might be entirely developed by you. There may be elements that are less in your control. There may be third party components or features of the product that um, that that you know less uh, about. And therefore, if you're introducing those at a later stage when you've got lots of mass deployment already, you do want to try and keep on top of any any potential vulnerabilities or bugs that, that could be introduced through those types of processes. Um, and also, sometimes people release uh, releases for um, optimization of performance. You may have had good intent there, but you may have changed the behavior somewhere else within the device. So fuzzing, once again, gives you a benefit of um, being able to run regression testing, look back at things that have been done before and make sure that any new releases you put into the field are, are not uh, compromised through you know, lack of rigor or, or lack of understanding the, the, the types of changes that may be introduced in other parts of the product. Um, so there's a strong play for reusing previous tests and evidence. Uh, we're not suggesting that vendors should run masses and masses of tests every time they do tests. A lot of this is automated. A lot of it's um, regression based. As long as you understand where your product is in, in, in the development life cycle and roughly what's changed in it, uh, you can test those bits of the product and, and continually um, uh, do the regression uh, to, to re retain a level of confidence in your in your product. And then just on the final point, um, another thing we see quite a lot of is when a product has been deployed, we often see the development teams that have been working on those products uh, moved on to something else, yeah, redeployed onto, onto the next product that's under development. And therefore, having an ability to trace back uh, the types of tests that were done on the original releases uh, and rerun those on new releases um, is, is really important because obviously uh, we find development teams are often under stress doing other things and they have to have enough memory to, to go back and look at what's been done before when they're, when they're doing these new release cycles. So there's lots to think about there and, and, and lots of benefits um, uh, that we see uh, from first-hand experience. So uh, on that basis, I'm going to hand over to Chris now, who's going to cover off some of those sort of real cases uh, from a high level. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Matt. Yes, so um, I'm going to delve in. Matt has given you a quite a high level um, and quite generic view of how fuzzing could fit into uh, a sort of generic um, product development lifecycle. I'm going to get stuck into the nitty gritty of a case study of uh, based on real examples of how we've seen people do this in the, in this case, the smart metering space. Um, so I'm going to take you through one of uh, one of those. Um, before I do that, I'm going to do two quick primers just to help you follow uh, how we're using it. Um, the first is you'll see automation and a sort of integration mentioned all over the place uh, in the future slides. So I'm going to just uh, very briefly touch on what we mean by that and how we automate protocol, which is our tool that we're basing this on. Um, so basically, all you need to know for this is that Protocol has an automation API that can be invoked, uh, and it also has a command line interface that can be called as command line programs. And both of these mechanisms are available to use to automate uh, uh, performing the normal tasks of Protocol. Basically, anything that you could do in the full GUI environment, you can do through uh, the automation. Most of it you can simply do by invoking the right command line tools. And the command line programs are sufficiently modular as well that they allow you to sort of piece them together in a very Unixy fashion to uh, achieve all sorts of different workflows um, with the same base set of um, simple commands. So when we talk about automation, normally people are automating it through the CLI, but there is a full API if they need to. And they can roll this into their batch file system if, the, if that's what they're doing. We see people do that. Lots of people still do that. Uh, obviously, 
uh, automation environments, Jenkins, Travis, people have integrated into those and the full test management systems. So uh, you can integrate it into all sorts of things, but using a very simple and standard interface. So when I talk about automation, and when I talk about uh, integration, this is how people have achieved it. The other quick primer I wanted to do is um, to talk about um, one of the kind of unique things about protocol, which we covered in more detail in the first um, webinar, which is that it can you, it will decouple. We have decoupled the act of running the tests and gathering all the evidence from the act of um, analyzing that evidence and actually looking for problems and identifying results in that evidence. That might seem trivial, trivial, but it's very powerful. So you can now run the two back to back and together, or you can run them separately. And this enables you, when you're doing this in an automated environment, this enables you to uh, build up results over time and then analyze them later. Uh, people often uh, do things like sliding windows of uh, building up a window of results and then analyzing that in a particular time frame, say in sprints. Um, and this is very powerful. It, it's also very powerful, um, the ability to re reassess results later. Um, so you can go back, having learned something new, you can go back to old results and ask new questions or um, bring new understanding for finding results without having to rerun all the tests. These two things are really, really useful and important when doing this automated testing of smart meters because smart meters generally are not particularly fast. So you really don't want to um, have to uh, run and analyze at the same time because you might have to run for a very long time and that makes it one very long running process. So the ability to split it up and incrementally do it is very powerful, but you still end up with a full set of results. Also, if you if you investigate a problem that protocol has found later, and for whatever reason you decide either it's not a problem or you know how to fix it, but you want to then look further and find other results, you um you absolutely don't want to have to sit with a battery powered gas meter for another two weeks generating a new set of results to then look a new set of test data to look for results. So the ability to reassess later without having to rerun all the tests is particularly powerful in a smart metering context. Um, and it's a, it's a useful USP of protocoler. So those are two primers. Um, let's move on to actually looking at a, a, a workflow. So this is the, uh, uh, an example, a case study of an indicative workflow we've seen um, our meter customers use. I've specifically picked this one because it, it shows the, um, use of fuzzing throughout the, the whole life cycle, as Matt was alluding to. Um, we think that is the ideal case and the best practice that we would suggest people uh, aim for. However, um, uh, you can also extrapolate from that how if you want to start by only doing it in one place, you can start there and build out, uh, which is a very fair way of doing it. So this is an indicative case study we'll uh, talk through uh, in the next steps. So um, the first thing that they had, they were actually, this was a brand new product. This was actually a new source, new domain for them and a new set of protocols that they wanted to develop in. So actually the first thing for them was to get a baseline ability to speak the protocol and they wanted to create a proof of concept at sort of the design stage that would show them operating in this new space, doing the basic ability of speaking the protocol um uh, to build on later and prove the underlying concepts and actually even at this very early stage so many people will go well this is too early for fuzzing but actually in this very early stage you can still get a lot of benefit out of protocol and indeed they did because protocol has a deep understanding of the protocol out the box again we've covered this in earlier lectures so um uh what they we actually found them doing is doing exploratory testing through the protocol, the GUI, to uh, st improve their understanding of the protocol, to test out some of the key features in the proof of concept they were designing. Um, so it was, for example, there was basic security and cryptography going on on all sorts of messages. They were able to prove out those routines using protocol as a, as a test case, test example, test bed. Um, 
And so they were able to build out like that. Protocol was also able to pick up for them all sorts of minor mistakes and non-conformances they were making in the protocol information, because although we tout it as a an ability to find or having an ability to find security vulnerabilities, which indeed is its raison d'etre, um, it also has the ability to just, because it understands the protocol, to tell you when you're doing the protocol wrong. And this was very useful for them at this early proof of concept stage. And then finally, um, they were actually intending to use a whole bunch of third party components, as everyone is. Um, uh, nowadays, nobody writes all the code from scratch. So, for example, in this case, they wanted to use an ASN1 parser to uh, do both message passing and certificate passing. They had selected one, but Protocol was actually able very early on to find a bunch of problems, bugs, potential security vulnerabilities in the ASN1 parser. And in this case, they were able to take that away to the third party and get them fixed early and in parallel, rather than imagine if this had come much later in the process, uh, that that could have been, that reliance on a third party could have been a big problem. You could also, they didn't, but you could also at this stage have decided, oh, we might select a different ASN1 parser that's more robust before building our entire um, implementation around it. So these are the ways you can do it at the design phase. Um, and out of that, the main thing that they got is bunch, a helping hand to get up and running with the protocol and the confidence to proceed um, to full development. So looking at their full development process, this will be pretty familiar to people. They were running a sort of basic sprint-based approach. Um, so they're running these regular sprints, incrementally adding the um, full meter functionality on top of their sort of proof of concept base. Um, and with protocol in this, they're automatically running, they were automating the running of protocol tests on their nightly continuous testing bed. So every night they'd run, a, they, before each sprint, they would create a targeted um, generator config. We covered this earlier, telling protocol what to test that was focused on the areas that they were working on in that particular sprint, but including a little bit of stuff they'd already done before as a regression. They were running it nightly. They were incrementally building up the results. And by the end of the sprint, they would have a complete set of results for those areas, which they would then feed into the sprint review, which would give them useful metrics on how, uh, you know, whether any bugs or issues have been introduced through the course of that sprint, early warning of that, and also an ability to track the um, stability throughout the sprint to make sure that's not decreasing. So that gave them useful metrics and they were iteratively doing this, building out the functionality. Of course, at uh, um, some point they will want to uh, move to getting ready for release. So they did a maintenance, uh, they did a feature freeze and then they just did maintenance or uh, uh, maintenance uh, cycles, sprint cycles, to iteratively fix bugs and check stability and optimize, moving toward version one. Um, and again, we they were using protocol that's sensing that. Interestingly here as well, they had a, a certification re requirement. So they needed to get this product certified when it got to version one, on top of the normal due diligence that you would, you would expect for uh, just being confident in your verse, version one for release. So this is a very similar, they use a very similar strategy here to the previous smaller sprint releases, but instead here they used a much more comprehensive um, generator config for protocol, so aiming for wide coverage of the protocol, and they were running much um, larger batches of uh, tests, so really driving up the coverage and the depth of testing still running it nightly, but then analyzing it weekly um, and incrementally bu uh, building up these results to gain confidence that their product was robust and stable. Obviously, protocol is spitting out these metrics so they can, they can both see if issues are being picked up or introduced. They can watch the metrics of stability and robustness improving over time, and you could definitely see that trend in their case. And this was giving them confidence that by the time they get to their version one, their product is sufficiently robust, sufficiently secure to, to be let out into the world. And because they had a certification requirement, they could then bottle that evidence of that testing and those outcomes as concluded by Protocoler uh, as evidence for their certification authority to, um, to say, yes, we've done a sensible level of due diligence and testing. Our product is robust. 
So they got their version one out. Um, and then obviously, as Matt alluded to, sadly, that's not job done for us software developers. Uh, people then start using it. Things change, problems occur, um, and you want to do maintenance cycles. They had their sort of defined maintenance cycle process where they, they'd aim for a maintenance release. They do some dev around that. And then they would have a freezing. It's kind of like their mini version one release process. So they then have a freezing and a testing phase and then signing off that release. In this phase, they actually only use protocol in that freezing um, freezing window. So they uh, generally would have a week long window where they would, having got their candidate firmware for the maintenance release, they would do a similar uh, uh, cycle of nightly tests building up uh, test evidence. In this case, they're using generator configs and robustness metrics from the earlier steps in the process to say, well, that's the baseline. The maintenance release should get no worse. So they had a sign off criteria of saying there should be no new issues. Protocol, there shouldn't be highlighting new issues. Um, but also, and also that we shouldn't see a drop off in the robustness metrics. It should be no, no less robust than previous versions. And through doing that, they were able to have those metrics to then use that as part of the sign off. And again, because their um, certification, there was a certification aspect to this particular case, they also could bottle that maintenance release results as evidence, in this case, to a certification body, but it could also go to manufacturers, like, like uh, customers and other th interested third parties to go, yeah, we're doing the right level of um, testing of this release and yes it is secure and robust for your use so uh this is this was a whistle stop tour of um how to integrate um or one strategy for integrating protocol into your uh development process you can see that actually most of our customers particularly uh product developers end up leaning heavily on automation and leaning heavily on the metrics of proto protocol the producers to feed into their dev process um, but this will give you a good feel for how you would do this yourself and which bits you can adopt. I'm now going to actually um, hand to Tony, who I think is going to sum up the uh, the conclusion of all these webinars for us and tell us what we've learned. Over to you, Tony. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, at the end of this, at the end of the series of, of three webinars that we've done, um, I, we're still going to come back to this question of why should you be fuzzing? And our answers to that are on the slide here. The first and most important thing probably is that fuzzing finds problems that other tests don't. We know this because we've tested previously released products and found new issues in them. And, and developers have chosen to fix those. So that it hasn't been our our saying you must have to fix them, they have the choice and they've chosen to fix them. We know that fuzzing during development uh, finds bugs when they're easier, quicker and cheaper to fix. That um, this, this isn't really a, a new finding, of course, but what we're emphasizing is that you can add fuzzing to find those other harder to find bugs during development. We know that having a, a separate fuzzing stage before product release, as Chris has been talking about in the case study, uh, enables you to have an external demonstration of the resilience and the assurance in, in the product, rather than just making assertions, making statements, you, you've got some evidence that, that you can use. If you've got third party components, and again, as we said today, who doesn't now, uh, then this can strengthen your acceptance tests of those and, and even interoperability tests. We, we've talked to people who are interested in, in uh, checking how other other parts that they're buying in will respond to or that they have to communicate with how those parts will will respond to the sorts of messages that uh, uh, attackers might throw at them fuzzing is based on using automation to avoid the sort of assumptions and unconscious biases and mistaken beliefs that otherwise we can build into our, our testing cycles uh, the the automated basis the, the defined, specified uh, coverage basis, all of that, automating it, doing automated analysis, th this, this gets us a degree of independence from what we think should be tested or what we think is worth testing. We just do all of this automated testing. 
And in that, we use huge numbers of tests so that we get high coverage of the protocol, of the interface that we're, we're trying to fuzz. And then finally, the way that results are prioritized and the sort of detailed reporting that particularly we've, we've made an effort to include in protocol, make sure that you get a simplified way to do uh, the fault diagnosis, the debugging, and then the regression testing after you've fixed it. So this, this helps you not only to find, but to actually diagnose and fix. That's, that's part of the, the fuzzing you should be looking to do. So we then have the summary statement at the bottom, which we hope we've justified through this series of webinars, uh, that fuzz testing is in fact one of the most beneficial things you can do to improve and to demonstrate internally or externally the security and robustness of your products. And with that, that's the end of what we have and we move, I think, to questions. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you to Matt and Chris as well for their insightful contributions to today's webinar session. Um, you know, particularly Chris's case study was very good at showing practical examples, so thank you for that. Um, as Tony mentioned, it's now time to take any questions that you have, so please do send anything through using the Q&A button on your screen. Um, but for now, I will kick off with the first question. Um, in practical terms, how much fuzzing can be done overnight? Um, perhaps, Tony, maybe you can take that one for us? Uh, yes. Um, so so the, that, that question, we, we can actually bring that back to, to what resources you have available to do the testing overnight. So one of the things that we uh, do enable in, in it, it's been particularly important when we've been looking at smart metering uh, is to be able to split up testing. So we can uh, protocol will enable you to split up a, a specified set of tests amongst as many or as few different platforms as you want, and then to recombine the results so that you can analyze together and report together. So to some extent, it depends on what resources you, you have available to do the overnight testing, you can split. Um, the other things you can do to make sure it fits with what resources you, you've got are to, uh, uh, to target, you, you can adjust the tests you generate to target particular functionality, maybe the, the functionality being implemented in that sprint would be an obvious one, of course. Um, the other things you're probably going to be looking at are how do you split up? Uh, so if you're accumulating evidence for something like a certification scheme, there may be certain numbers of tests. I mean, again, for the for the UK, there are guideline uh, uh, amounts of testing that uh, that are expected. So you'll be looking to accumulate those. So you can you can aim at doing all of those overnight. That's probably too ambitious. So again you're probably going to be dividing up by the number of the number of fuzzing sessions and the number of platforms you've got um so i think the answer the answer there is as much or as little as you wanted uh, again some of the previous webinars have shown in more detail how you actually do this adjustment in in practice of numbers uh, of tests um but it it certainly should be possible to uh, uh, to, to accumulate the results over time, even if you can't run all of the tests that you want to overnight. Great, thank you, Tony. Um, and a second question. Um, I like this one, actually. <laughs> Can you start fuzzing too early? Is that such a thing? Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to take this one or Tony, whether you want to jump in. I'm I'm happy to take it as soon as you as soon as you can exchange messages with the target or in some way communicate with it, then I would say that you can start to get benefits. Now, um, there's probably no point in fuzzing something that isn't there. So if it doesn't exist yet, you probably can't fuzz it. So there probably is a too early point. But um, as soon as you have something that exists and uh, it's communicating, I think you can get real benefits from starting this process. Uh, indeed, we've seen our customers do it. In that case study I was talking about, uh, they really did find that protocol's ability just to trawl through parts of the protocol, just to be able to tell them 
exercise the authentication and the message exchange mechanisms in a very simple automated manner helped them a lot. Its ability to um, flag issues with their, with their implementation of the protocol, just using its deep knowledge of it to say you're not conformant, well, that's helpful to know before you go too far. Um, and then even the fuzzing itself, although, of course, on a proof of concept, they were getting lots of results and so on that, uh, you know, will dev out in time. But the, this input sanitization is hard. And the earlier you start, the more tractable the problem is. And the earlier you establish a baseline, the easier it is to make sure you maintain that baseline going forward. You really don't want to get way down the line when you've written reams and reams of code and then find, oh, you know, you're not sanitizing properly. And then it becomes a huge burden to reassess all the code and reassess how to put that in. So, you know, if it, it doesn't exist, you can't fuzz it. But once it does exist, you can, and you will start getting benefits. And I think we've seen that in examples. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we're coming up to the 45 minute mark. So I think we will leave it there for today. Um, if you do have any follow up questions, please feel free to send them through to us. Um, thank you all for your time today. As mentioned, this is the last in our series of three webinars that CITAL is running on fuzz testing smart meters, but there will be further series coming throughout the year on other fuzzing topics and also targeting other markets. So if you'd like to keep up to date with any further activities and events, please do subscribe to our LinkedIn. Uh, we will be sharing a recording of today's webinar um, with all the attendees in our follow-up communications, along with a link to the previous webinars on our YouTube page. Um, as I said, if you do have any further questions that you'd like to put to the team, please get in touch with David using the contact details that are on the screen now. Uh, just before we end today's session, I'd like to let you know that upon leaving the webinar, you will be asked to complete a short feedback survey and we do really appreciate any responses you're able to share with us on today's event. So thank you very much for your time. And um, we're really pleased to have you with us here today. And um, we look forward to seeing you at the next series of Sightel webinars later this year. Thank you very much. <laughs>